So, I, do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. Um, thank you. I, I'd like to uh, thank my colleagues and my Antonietta because we had to change uh, the order of the presentations. I had to catch a flight from Milano around noon, so I'll be disappearing like a thief. Um, and I will miss also uh, the questions session at the end. So, um, it is difficult to talk about the ExoMars rover in just 15 minutes, so I decided to focus just on three points or three take-home messages. Um, and that means that there are many things that I will not be able to tell you about. First of all, I'd like to ask if you could raise your hands if you saw the rover yesterday during the visit. Okay, I hope you have seen how cool it is. And I'll try to convince you that this is a great, great mission. Um, so, first of all, I was in Istanbul uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, giving a talk to in a high school, and we were super shocked because we were six days from going to the launch pad. We had everything ready for launch, uh, the software tested, everything tested. Um, when, when we received news of, of the invasion, and in the beginning we didn't know what was going to happen. We hoped this would be a, a short thing that would stop quickly. And then the news came in March that it was no go. And this has been really, really a big shock for the team. Not only for us at ESA, but also for our colleagues in Russia. Uh, and these are great guys that we had been working with for a very long time, dear friends uh, who, who, you know, don't like any of what's happening. Um, as it is, we, we had to find a way, and the way is we are reforming the mission for a launch in 2028. Um, one of the things that we have to do is we have disassembled the lander, which was mainly a Russian responsibility, taking the European avionics and other elements out, and we're going to put them into a new lander that is going to be developed here at TASAI um, to embark the rover and launch it, this time from the US, with the help, a little bit of help from NASA for some elements that we don't have in Europe. So let's move on to these three points, why this mission is so interesting from a scientific point of view and why it dovetails so well with other missions that are going to Mars. The first thing is the landing site. The landing site is amazing. Um, in this diagram, you see represented the first one billion years of the terrestrial planets in the solar system. So uh, the solar system was formed roughly 4.57 uh, billion years ago. And here at the top, you see these color bars. They, I tried to represent um, you know, the first, the final stages of accretion in which the planets, the terrestrial planets, so this applies to Mars, uh, Venus, and Earth, uh, were essentially giant balls of magma from which, as they cooled down, the primordial atmospheres were outgassed. Then when the water vapor in those atmospheres was able to condense, we had these global oceans of very large bodies of water, which initially were hot because there was still very high pressure. And then as, as the temperature of the, these large masses of water cooled down, you started to have uh, the first, let's say, opportunity for interesting organic uh, chemistry reactions to remain stable. Because if the water is too hot, the things, they just break down. So on Earth, this blue bar, which is uh, the conditions compatible with life, carbon-based life, as we know it, extends all the way to the right. But in Mars, we know that roughly 3.8 billion years ago, 3.9, uh, something important happened, and uh, the planet lost most of its atmosphere, and it became very difficult for water to exist uh, in a liquid phase on the surface. So, when we tried to look for traces of life on Mars or possible, uh, 
let's say, biology that may have developed on Mars, it is very important to try to target this, this blue bar here. And the, our landing site, these are the deposits, you see, they, they have an age that is uh, consistent with that. And, and here, you see what are the landing site ages for the missions that have gone to Mars so far. So Gale Crater is roughly dated at 3.6 billion years, and Mars was already drying out by then. Perseverance landed in Jezero, that's about 3.8. These are two, um, let's say, bodies of water that existed in uh, craters, or crater lakes. We are targeting, uh, you will see, it's a very interesting uh, site. It's on the Circumcrease uh, Planitia area. This is the border, it's, it's more or less on the, on the edges of the dichotomy on Mars that separates the northern uh, highlands from the southern lowlands. And what you see in red here are uh, large fields of phyllosilicates. These are typically record the interactions of uh, volcanic precursor minerals with water to form clay-rich minerals. So um, you have to remember that Mars was far away uh, from the sun, as it is today, but the sun shone less bright four billion years ago. But the planet was still an infant planet and was a lot of heat coming in from below. So when you think of this landscape as it might have been four billion years ago, imagine Antarctica with volcanoes and hydrothermal systems. So you know, a lot of ice and, and sort of lakes where water may have melted, but a lot of heat coming from below. So a lot of water circulation below. It's a very interesting conditions for rich organic chemistry to take place. So this is what we think may happened uh, at a landing site in Oxia Planum. By the way, this is a picture of Oxia Planum. It looks rough, but it's really, really smooth. Uh, so initially we had uh, this uh, crustal layer uh, that interacted with water to form large clays. There is a delta at uh, one uh, side of the ellipse that is dated at 3.9 billion years. And for a delta to form, it means that the deposits had to come into a body of water. And there is nothing between us and the North Pole. So the chances are that if there was a body of water here, it was a large body of water. So we may have a chance at Oxia Planum to perhaps say something about the possible existence of a northern ocean if that was the case. Then uh, there was a lot of erosion, a retreat of this uh, water mass. Um, you see the remnants uh, of the erosion. And then about 2.5 billion years ago, the whole place was covered by this pyroclastic deposit that we call the capping unit that has helped us to protect from uh, the ravages of ionizing radiation. And then there's been more erosion and today uh, things look a bit complicated. Um, so what we see in the larger Marth Valleys area is these very finely laminated layers of clays. And you can think of this as, uh, how should I put it, the, the rings on a tree trunk. So each one of these layers records an instance of uh, deposition of something and, and then interaction with water. And um, there is much better mineral uh, variability, if you like, in Marth Valleys. But what is interesting about Oxia Planum is that we have access to the bottom of this stack, so the older uh, section. And all other things being equal, going back in time as far as possible is very interesting. So I hope I convinced you that the landing site is, is, is a new type of landing site that we will be exploring on Mars and it's very exciting. The second thing I want to talk about is surface, subsurface access. If we, there are other, many things that are a pain on Mars. Uh, UV light goes through the uh, very tenuous atmosphere. Um, it produces oxidants that when get activated, they destroy organic molecules. But the thing that bothers us the most is ionizing radiation. If you look at the uh, radiolysis destruction equation, uh, we will uh, look at a graph in a moment about this. This is a molecule surviving fraction, so 10 to the zero means everything survived, 10 to the minus three, one thousandth of what you had in the beginning survived. The radiolysis constant 
Um, here I put the scales with molecular uh, weight, but it's not true. It's, it has to do with the size of the molecules. You can think of ionizing radiation as bullets being fired by a machine gun, and, and you're a target. And the larger you are, the more are the chances that you will get hit by a bullet. Um, and D is the dose, which we didn't know much about until uh, in, uh, ah, it's a pity you should have seen a picture of Mars here. I don't know why it doesn't show up. But in 2014, Curiosity for the first time was able to measure what the dose was at the surface. And from that, we were able to peg uh, everything that we had been doing with modeling to that. So this is a very important graph. You see survival fraction on the, on the left and burial depth at the bottom. And here we have carried out an experiment in which in, in glass ampules you expose a mixture of amino acids to accelerated gamma radiation to try to uh, model what the surviving fraction would be for exposures to half a billion, one, two, three, and four billion years of ionizing radiation. And we do this for amino acids because they are a major component of cells. They can preserve biochirality, which is a very important biosignature, and because the subsurface of Mars is so cold, they can uh, survive for billions of years uh, if they are not destroyed by radiation. And if we look at Earth at some of the oldest deposits, so this is a deposit from, uh, with an age of 3.3 billion years, we see that roughly 10 to the minus 4 of the material is organics. If for the sake of argument we say, let's assume they're all amino acids, um, then you ask yourself, what is the maximum level of damage that we can sustain and still be able to make a good detection? So our instruments have a detection threshold of 10 to the minus 9, but to be able to convince a naturally skeptic scientific community, we would like to have 10 to the minus 6 to have a good detection. And if you start from 10 to the minus 4 and you don't want to sustain more than 10 to the minus 6, uh, the maximum damage that you can uh, sustain is 10 to the minus 2. And then if we want to study stuff that was 4 billion years in age, then you travel this purple curve and you see where it intersects that line. And that is what gives us roughly the depth that we should be collecting samples at if we want to be sure that they're in a good state of preservation. And that is the reason why the drill on ExoMars is able to go to 2 meters in depth. So here you see in this little movie, um, the rover that you saw yesterday, collecting uh, a sample from 1.7 meters depth. You have to understand that this capability of accessing organic material at depth on Mars is a game changer from the point of view of understanding uh, organic chemistry and organic molecules on Mars. And one thing that this rover does that is unique is it can analyze the, the exact mineral grains for mineralogy and for organic chemistry. And this is very important because when we will be able to detect some interesting molecule, we will be able to say exactly on which mineral we found it. So this is uh, a key aspect of the mission as well. So here you see the central piston of the drill pushing out the sample into this little hand that then retracts and sends it into the analytical laboratory drawer. So the other thing I want to talk about is the payload. And here I don't have time to talk about all the instruments, so I will talk about only one aspect. Am, am I doing in time? Done? Okay. So I want to tell you about a new capability of the main organics detection instrument we have, which is the ability to use for the first time UV laser radiation to desorb organic molecules. This is very important because all the missions that have gone to Mars until now that have had ovens, ours also has ovens, have been plagued by the presence of perchlorate oxidants mixed in the soil. But this UV laser, the energy deposition is so fast and done in such a way that we can extract the organics without exciting the perchlorates. And so, uh, so here you see this works in uh, 
uh, in ambient uh, Martian, and so we make a vacuum in the mass spectrometer, and there is this uh, trigger valve that allows the, the ions, the organic ions, to be sucked in for the detection within the ion trap mass spectrometer. So this, is again, is a next generation instrument that we will use for the first time in ExoMars, but that is also flying on Dragonfly to Titan. So if you want to learn more about the mission, I urge you, please, have a look at this uh, special issue of astrobiology. Uh, in, in, among the other things, I, was, I loved the debate between Jean-Pierre and, and Nathalie, and, and it's, here you will, you will learn a lot about how we envision the search for biosignatures on Mars, which sort of things we would like to look for. And of course, we, we don't know if there was life, what it was based on. So ExoMars is a, is a machine that is designed to search for chemical complexity. So this is a final view graph. I hope I have been able to convince you that uh, this mission is still, in 2028, interesting and compelling. We'll travel back in time to a place and an epoch that hasn't been explored on Mars before. The water, uh, or the interactions of water with deposits at the landing site are the oldest we know of. Uh, we have a great payload. We will be able to investigate for the first time the Martian subsurface, and we will make fundamental discoveries in organic chemistry. Thank you so much. Thank you.